Hi, and welcome to the MVAC Lab. I'm research intern Cindy Kutchick. Seashells might make us think of the seashore, but the freshwater mussels of the upper Mississippi River system and their shells also deserve our attention. Dr. Jim Thieler, MVAC Senior Research Associate and Professor Emeritus of the UWL Department of Archaeology and Anthropology, has long studied freshwater mussel shells from archaeological sites in the Upper Midwest and conducted research into where, how, and why people sought and used them. Today, we warmly welcome him as he shares his extensive knowledge on the fascinating biology of mussels, how indigenous peoples and later Euro-Americans used them as a resource, and some of the ecological challenges these amazing mollusks have endured and continue to face. Hello, I'm Jim Thieler. I'm associated with the Mississippi Valley Archaeology Center. I'm a retired archaeologist from UW La Crosse, and I have, am in a group that they refer to as zooarchaeologists, people that study animal remains from ancient archaeological sites. And one of the things we commonly find on archaeological sites in the Midwest are freshwater mussels. Probably everybody's seen a mussel or clamshell along a stream or river. Uh, they are bivalved, they have two halves. They are a hard carbonate shell that protects the soft tissue on the inside. Uh, they are immersed in the stream in the, sub, in, the, in the substratum of the stream and they only open a little bit. And they respirate through, through tubes that go through their, their soft tissue and they are filter feeders and filter breeders, taking in micronutrients. And uh, they spend most of their time immersed in one spot in the stream. Some may move a little bit, but mostly they're in one spot. And some individuals of so some species live 50 to 75 years of age. Uh, they're often called by what they look like. This happens to be a pocketbook. It's a common name. They all have scientific names, too. It looks like an old-fashioned pocketbook in the old days. We have some that look like rough surface, ridge surface, like washboard. This is a washboard mussel. This is one of the larger species in the river, found in the Mississippi River. The smaller species, the lily put, is an adult shell. Occurs, again, in the Mississippi River to give you a range of size for freshwater mussels. Some species are what they do rather than how they look. This is called a heel splitter. And again, this would be in the, located in the stream bed, just a portion sticking out of the sediment. And if you step on this, you'd know why they call it a heel splitter. Very, very uh, sharp margins. Uh, as I indicated, these are filter breeders. Uh, Males and females are sometimes sexually dimorphic, they have a different shape. Males upstream fertilize females downstream. Uh, females have fertilized eggs, which are called glycadia. The glycadia are held in a special pouch called a brood pouch for various times, but roughly 30 days or so. Then they must extrude those little glycadia to be baby mussels. They must attach to host for a period of a few weeks. And the host is usually a fish, sometimes a salamander, but usually a fish. And in this family, the Lampsilidae, or lamps, lamp shells, uh, the female literally puts up a lure, part of her mantle, part of her soft tissue, and it looks like exactly like a minnow, even has an eye spot. Fish comes down and grabs it, she extrudes the glycadia, they go in the fish's mouth and, and, and uh, area and attach to the fins or gills. They will burrow in, they'll spend a few weeks there, and then they'll drop off as little mussels, hopefully, in good territory for them to develop into adult mussels.
Native American peoples of our area collected freshwater mussels. Uh, they collected them as a food source, collected them sometimes to use the shells as tools of various kinds. Uh, often a shell such as a pocketbook would be taken and these pseudo-cardinal and cardinal teeth would be ground out and the edge smooths and they can make a very nice spoon or container, which they frequently did. Uh, occasionally they were modified into ornaments such as beads and uh, importantly in la later Native American times in our region uh, freshwater mussel shells were gathered, burned, crushed and used as tempering material with clay to make ceramic vessels. This one you can see perhaps the this, this specks of shell it made for very strong sturdy vessels and large vessels. Uh, we think that uh, uh, most shells were collected, most freshwater mussels were collected by women and children in low water periods during the summer, late, late summer period. And uh, we don't think they dove for mussels. Uh, there are deep water species such as the washboard, they're very rare, another called the elephant ear, very rare in the archaeological record, but we know historically they were probably pretty common. Uh, native peoples harvested sometimes in vast numbers, thousands, tens of thousands. Some archaeological sites in Prairie du Chien and the Rock Island have hundreds of thousands of freshwater mussel valves, and these are adjacent to fire hearths or charcoal where we believe they were put on probably on a charcoal base with vegetation and steamed out and opened to recover the meat. We think the meat, the freshwater mussels, which is about 85% moisture. If you get a fresh meat and dry it out, dry it bone dry in the air, it loses about 85% of its weight and you end up with, with mussel tissue that looks like these dried ones that I did as an experiment long ago. And uh, these can be easily stored for winter as a protein source. And uh, they look dry and hard, but they can be crushed quite easily. And they become, uh, when you immerse in water, much like oatmeal. So a nice, tasty winter treat. We can identify different species of freshwater mussels, often by the shape of the shell. And a washboard is a pretty distinct species. It's very much different than a smooth shell uh, pocketbook here. Uh, looking at different configurations of the inner hinge can give us some good indication depending on the particular species. And fresh specimens, color helps, the exterior color helps. Uh, but we often don't have that archaeologically. Sometimes we do, but often we don't. We also have what's called sculpture, different patterns on what's called the beak or umbo of the shell right at the back. This has got a double loop bar on this heel splitter, marks it very distinctly, even if we have a small piece of the hinge. We get something called phenotypic plasticity, and we get different positions in streams uh, freshwater mussels are largely stream animals. A few species will live in lakes. These are largely stream animals. And the same species, this is a pig toe, and this is a pig toe. This is a big river pig toe. It's inflated and heavy. This is a small stream pig toe. It's gracile and much less inflated. So we get this kind of differences which allow us to distinguish the water they came from, the type of habitat they came from. That can be very important. We go to small interior rock shelters and we find large stream phenotypes. Well, we know that those were brought in. We get rare shells such as ebony, such as uh, washboards, and uh, they can tell us uh, they're often for a special use, but they are brought in from only the Mississippi River if they occur, and they do sometimes. Uh, Washboards occur as a preferential shell at the Yazdland site, Jefferson County, Wisconsin, over by Lake Mills, and these were perforated and used for agricultural instruments, hose, and uh, well, we're sure they were brought in. They don't occur in the Rock River and haven't based on the archaeological and modern surveys.
North America had about 300 species of freshwater mussels, the most of any place in the world. In the upper Mississippi River Valley, we have about 50 species. And some of these are restricted to the big waters like the Mississippi. Some are almost entirely small stream species. But we've lost a lot of these due to a variety of things. In fact, we've lost half of our 50 species and badly damaged or completely lost due to European advancement and development. Uh, first of all, agricultural runoff initially was a real problem in many areas, smothered beds of freshwater mussels. Mussels often occur in dense aggregates or beds on the stream base bottom. You may have uh, 15 or 20 or 30 mussels per square yard of, of real estate on the bottom of a stream. Sediment blocks them in, smothers them, it's a real problem. Uh, we had pearl rushes beginning in the 1850s, began in Ohio in the 1850s. Freshwater pearls were found in mussels. People would go out and strip beds of freshwater mussels, steam open the mussel, and look for pearls inside. Tiffany and Company in New York uh, uh, sent buyers around to to buy pearls. Some were quite valuable. Some ended up in the crown jewels of England, as I understand it. Uh, about 1880, uh, a German named Boppel came to America. He'd been sent freshwater mussels, and he was a button maker, mostly made buttons out of bone at that time, the large animal bones. And they sent him some freshwater mussels. He exper experimented with mussels and he found that they would make a very nice button. We sometimes find what we call button shells. I went to Muscatine, Iowa, the heart of this industry in the 1880s and 90s, and collected numbers of these were still available at the middens. And uh, Boppel started factories and cut out button blanks, ground them into buttons. And they're beautiful, hard, resilient material, calcium carbonate, and they were sold by the hundreds of thousands, if not the millions, on cards. This is a button card, this is pearls, and these are lancing pearls. Button factories developed all over the country, all over the Midwest at least, and uh, shells were stripped rather aggressively. One of the ways that they were harvested was by a device known as a crow foot bar. These are crow feet, and they would hang several of these on a, on a steel bar. They would lower that in a rope in the river, take a boat, and this would be on a winch. And these would drag across the bottom. These crow foots would drag across the muscle, would close on it, and these little beads would hold them, and the guy would crank up the crank pull up the mussels hanging from these, pick out the ones he wanted, and throw the ones he didn't back in the river. Very effective means resulted in a huge loss of freshwater mussels. Another aspect of damage to freshwater mussels was uh, human construction of dams. Dam at Keokuk, Iowa, uh, closed off the Mississippi River. It didn't have fishways, so migratory fish called the skipjack herring, a small silvery fish about 12 inches long, migrated up and down the Mississippi River. They closed off the Keokuk Dam in 1913, and they cut, up the, cut, up, cut off the only known source for the ebony shell mussel. It's a host for the ebony shell mussel larva, Glycadia. And uh, this species has disappeared from the Mississippi River. This is one of the most common species. This is one that was heavily exploited by Native American peoples. The 1960s and 70s, uh, biological supply houses went in, and scuba divers, and started stripping streams of mussels to uh, uh, supply for biological classes and courses around the country. You could send off and get a mussel uh, or a group of mussels for your biology class to be dissected. And uh, at this point, this is no longer allowed.
I should point out that today there are strict restrictions on freshwater mussels. And if you're in Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, or Minnesota, you want to check your regulations very carefully before you collect or pick up any freshwater mussel. Any freshwater mussel today that's alive in Wisconsin cannot be collected unless you have a special permit. Some shells can be collected and some can't. So I said we have about 50 species and about half of those are protected and those shells may not be collected even as empty shells. So please check your DNR website wherever you are if you want to collect shells and be sure you're collecting illegal species. There are ones you can collect, but you have to, you have to almost have a guide and be very careful. Um, DNR also has some programs with professionals that go out and survey mussels and involve the public sometimes. And they have programs that set up where you can go out and collect mussels, photograph them, re replace the mussels, and send that uh, information to the DNR. So check the DNR webpage and see what their specifications are today. Thank you very much. A big thank you to Dr. Thieler. We hope you've enjoyed watching him expound on freshwater mussels and what their shells can tell us about how people lived in the past on up to the present. For more information, see the description box. And to further explore archaeological topics, find links to MVAC social media, and view and subscribe to our monthly e-news, check out the MVAC website. You can also donate online to support MVAC's work, including our videos. Thanks for watching.